Hello and welcome history buffs. My name is Nick Hodges and you may think I'm a bit of a hipster for saying this, but they don't make him like they used to. I am of course talking about Waterloo. If you're like me and you're getting sick and tired of this oversaturation of CGI in our Hollywood movies, then boy do I have a film for you. Waterloo is, without a doubt, one of the greatest historical war films you will ever see in your entire life. Made in 1970 by Soviet director Sergei Bondarchuk, this is an extremely faithful on-screen adaptation of the Battle of Waterloo. And when I say faithful, I mean exactly that. Like, right off the pages of history and presented on-screen are the real engagements, formations, cavalry charges and the tactics used by the Duke of Wellington and Napoleon Bonaparte. This is a film that even the most hardcore history buff can enjoy, and the amount of work that went into it is nothing short of astonishing. Shot entirely in the Ukraine, the filmmakers used 16,000 soldiers from the Soviet Red Army as background extras. So that means every single soldier you see on the screen at any given time is a real person. This is the largest and most accurate reenacted battle you will ever see from the Napoleonic era. This is Waterloo. After 20 years of almost constant warfare, the first French Empire was on its very last legs. By March 1814, the combined armies of Great Britain, Austria, Prussia and Russia had invaded France and were almost at the very gates of Paris. And yet only two years before, Napoleon Bonaparte's empire was at its very height. Almost all of Western Europe was under his total dominion as he ruled the lives of over 60 million subjects. Not since the days of the Roman Empire had such a thing ever been achieved. At every turn, Napoleon's military genius had crushed the most powerful nations in Europe. The only one that continued to defy him was Great Britain. His original plans of invading the stubborn island nation were scrapped after a spectacular defeat at the Battle of Trafalgar. With much of his navy having been destroyed, the French Emperor chose to go instead after his bitter rival with a very different weapon economics. Napoleon introduced the very unpopular continental system which was a foreign policy that forbade all conquered and allied nations of France to trade with Great Britain. The idea behind this was that either Great Britain would eventually sue for peace or suffer an economic collapse and would be weak enough to be invaded at a later time. However, this embargo would prove to be more disruptive to the economies of France and her allies. In comparison, it was largely ineffective against British trade. The reason for this was that trade was still coming into the continent. One source was through Spain and Portugal, which of course helped set off the Peninsula War, and by 1810, Russia had also reopened trade with Great Britain. This act of defiance would be Napoleon's primary incentive in making the gravest mistake in his career. Against the advice of his friends and loved ones, he declared war on Russia. Do not go to Russia. You're at the height of your glory. From Portugal to Poland, Almost all Europe is yours. You rule over the destiny of over 60 million men. Do not go to Russia. On the 24th of June, 1812, Napoleon's Grand Armée invaded Russia with over 600,000 men. Aside from a few battles with the French, the Russian army focused on retreating and applying a scorched earth tactic of burning crops, towns and villages denying Napoleon's army the ability to live off the land and to rely solely on their overextended supply line. As the French were lured further and further into Russia, they finally caught up with the Russian army at Borodino, a small town 70 miles from Moscow. This was to be the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic War so far. Russian resistance was fierce and Napoleon didn't rely so much on his usual brilliant military strategy as much as just funneling more and more French soldiers into the slaughter. Both sides were taking massive casualties until finally, the Russian army retreated once again and was able to slip away in the night. Although Napoleon had taken Borodino, he hadn't achieved the decisive victory he desperately needed. After the battle, the Grand Armée pushed onto the city of Moscow, but found it almost completely abandoned and the streets were eerily silent. Later that evening, as Napoleon and his army rested after months of marching and bitter fighting, Hundreds of arsonists set fire to the city. Not even the holy capital was exempt from the Tsar's scorched earth policy. Two thirds of the city would burn to the ground, 
proving to Napoleon that the Russians would never give up and a decisive victory was nowhere in sight. The Grand Army was forced to retreat and began the long march back to France. Then things only went from bad to worse as the Russian winter came in. Temperatures plummeted well below freezing and the French died by the thousands as they froze and starved to death. Of the 600,000 men who went into Russia, only 28,000 returned. This was to be the beginning of the end for Napoleon's empire as Prussia and Austria would declare war once again. Napoleon would fight a losing defensive campaign for the next two years until finally the armies of Great Britain, Austria, Prussia and Russia were now on French soil. And this is where the movie begins, with the once mighty Grand Armée being virtually destroyed, Napoleon's general stated that the situation was hopeless, and the only choice now was to abdicate the throne. We are defeated, sire. For 20 years we followed you. You made a road of glory through Europe. We cannot even save the suburbs of Paris. The Austrians. They're in Versailles. The Cossacks are watering the horses in the sand. They can hear the Prussian cannon in Montmartre. There are four nations, four armies, four fronts against us. Abdicate. Your enemies will allow you to retire to the island of Elba with a personal guard of a thousand men. It is an honourable exile, sire. Napoleon begrudgingly signed the treaty renouncing the throne. At a heartfelt ceremony, Napoleon handpicked his most loyal soldiers from the old guard and said his goodbyes to the rest. Soldiers! Of my old guard! After 20 years, I have come to say goodbye. France has fallen, so remember me. Though I love you all, I cannot embrace you all. And so on May 1814, the Emperor of France left on a British warship to become the Emperor of a tiny island in the Mediterranean to live out the rest of his life in isolation. This really should have been the end of his story, but by one of the most dramatic twists of fate in history, Napoleon had one more fight left in him. This would take place in a field near Waterloo. When Napoleon abdicated the throne, the Allied coalition wasted no time in restoring the old French monarchy, placing Louis XVIII as king. At first, the French people welcomed the peace as they were quite frankly fed up by that point of Napoleon's endless wars. But eventually, King Louis became extremely unpopular with many of the changes he had made, such as demobilizing the army, raising taxes to help resolve France's poor economy, and the royalists were threatened to rescind many of the political reforms made during the revolution. But, in quite possibly the greatest comeback of all time, on February 26th, 1815, Napoleon and his personal guard fled Elba and sailed to France. He had figured, correctly, that his return would be immediately welcomed and supported by the French people once again. King Louis immediately ordered Field Marshal Ney to stop Napoleon on his march to Paris. On the 14th of March, Field Marshal Ney's regiment confronted Napoleon and his personal guard. Just as fighting was about to kick off, Napoleon ordered his men to lower their arms. And something incredible happened. If You want to kill your emperor? <laughs> Here I am.
It's unbelievable, I know, but this is exactly what happened, and not just this one time. When King Louis heard that Marshal Ney and his men deserted him, he would send more troops, and the exact same thing would happen again and again. Napoleon's numbers swelled from a few regiments to an entire army, all of them marching towards Paris. Eventually, King Louis figured out in the end that it was probably not a good idea to stick around, and he fled the country. Napoleon's gamble had paid off, and he had retaken France, all without firing a shot. The people welcomed back their old emperor with open arms. When news reached the rest of Europe, the old allies of Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia were stunned. Initially, Napoleon sent letters to each and every one of them asking for peace. They of course rejected it because they knew Napoleon was only buying time and that he was simply not yet ready to fight. So instead, they sent him their polite response. Well, they've done it. Declared me an enemy of humanity. All Europe has declared war against me. Not against France, but against me. They dignify you, sire, by making you a nation. No shit! How badass do you have to be to have an entire continent declare war against you? So anyway, Napoleon knew that he had little time before the old allies had mobilized a new coalition against him. Whilst they just had to organize their armies together, Napoleon had to practically build one from scratch, and within three months, he had raised nearly 200,000 men. However, the allies he would face had mustered over half a million, and were getting ready to attack France from multiple directions. So, Napoleon being Napoleon, decided the best defense was a good offense. He hoped that if he was able to take on each allied army individually before moving on to the next, then his request for peace would have to be accepted. And so on June 15th, 1815, Napoleon crossed the Belgian border with nearly 130,000 men to reach the allied armies near Brussels. There were the Prussians led by Marshal Blücher and the Anglo-Allied army led by Sir Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. Napoleon had to make sure that they didn't join and overwhelm him with their greater numbers. At first, his strategy of divide and conquer seemed to be working. On June 16th, he crushed a small Prussian force, sending them on a complete retreat. Bouchy! Gérard! You take 30,000 men! 30,000 men, one third of my army! You take them in and you pursue, you understand? You pursue Blucher. You don't let them regroup, you don't let them consolidate, and above all, you don't let them rejoin! With the Prussian army seemingly out of the way, Napoleon focused next on reaching the British allies. On June 17th, Wellington had set his army on top of a ridge line overlooking a valley near the village of Waterloo. In the valley were the two chateaus, Hougamont and La Haison. These two fortified farmhouses would be occupied by British and Allied sharpshooters. Their objective was to delay any French advance on the main army. Now with these two defensive positions, the ridge line giving him a natural shelter from French artillery fire, all Wellington had to do was hold his ground and wait for the Prussians. As the French army had positioned themselves during the night, Wellington expected that the battle would start by daybreak. Much to his surprise though, the French made no such movement as the hours began to drag. The reason for this was that the previous heavy night's rain had made the ground too muddy to put any cannons into position. Napoleon had no choice but to wait until the ground dried, costing him valuable time. The longer he waited, the more time Wellington had in receiving reinforcements. When the battle finally kicked off, it was already past 11. The French army started by attacking Hougamont and Wellington's right flank. This was only a feint though. Napoleon hoped that Wellington would send his reserves for support and in the process, weaken his center where the main attack was coming. But Wellington had predicted this move since he had studied many of Napoleon's victories in the past and was not gonna fall for his trap. He's committed Foyle's division now, sir. He intends to turn us on the right. What the master seems to intend and what he does will be as different as white knight to black bishop. We can quickly move the 95th down, sir. I do not intend to run around like a wet hen. Hougamont saw some of the most intensive and continuous fighting throughout the battle. However, the Allied garrison didn't buckle despite being heavily outnumbered. When Napoleon saw that Wellington had not taken the bait, he ordered an all-out artillery barrage. After softening them up, he sent in his infantry to smash through the Allied center. Despite being heavily bombarded earlier, 
the British line was able to hold on and inflict heavy casualties against the marching French columns. As the French retreated, the British heavy cavalry charged after them, but in the heat of battle, the Scots Greys had charged too far and were pounded by French cannon fire before being counterattacked themselves by French cavalry. Back! Get back! Sound the call! They were able to make it back to the ridge but had suffered terribly. At this point, thousands of lives had already been lost, but neither side had gained ground. Meanwhile, Marshal Grouchy was still chasing after the Prussians. My God, sir, the cannon are calling us. March to the sound of the guns. We are a third of the army. Our duty is to... Do not presume to teach me my duty, General Gerard. My orders from the Emperor were precise. To keep my sword in Blucher's back. What Grouchy hadn't realized yet was that his force had been chasing after the Prussian rearguard and the rest of Blucher's army had given him the slip. La Bedoyer! Yes, sir. What's moving there? I'm sorry, I had to do that, just to check if you were paying attention. No, it's not Bill and Ted, it's of course the Prussians. That's not necessary, that's not necessary, it's the Prussians. But as far as you and I are concerned, and the army, they're on the moon. Is that understood? Yes, sir. This Wellington wages war in a new way. He fights sitting on his ass. Where we'll have to move him off it. Later on, Field Marshal Ney saw the Allies move behind the ridge line. Thinking that they were retreating, he ordered a massive charge of 12,000 cavalrymen, hoping to cause a rout amongst Wellington's wavering army. What he didn't know, though, was that the Allies were waiting for them on the other side of the ridge and had laid a trap. Withdraw to square! Shoot up the horses! Fire up the horses! <laughs> Ney, in his over-eager attempt to win glory on the battlefield, had made a terrible mistake. Without infantry and artillery support, his men were easy targets. This was because the British square formations were the perfect defense against cavalry. The reason for this was because horses simply refused to charge into a line of men holding bayonets and muskets. They will instead ride around the squares, leaving them vulnerable to musket fire from other square formations. Without being able to break through the squares, Ney had no choice but to retreat. Napoleon by this point was desperate, as the Prussians had finally arrived and were closing in on his army's right flank. He sent troops to slow the Prussians down and ordered an infantry attack on La Haison that was being defended by the King's German Legion. Despite their courageous efforts, they were overwhelmed by the French. Having taken the chateau, Napoleon was now free to commence his final attack that would finish the Allies off. Wellington's beaten. He's bled to death. Now. Now move the old guard forward, then on to Brussels. Now the old guard were Napoleon's best soldiers. They were all veterans and throughout the Napoleonic Wars had never surrendered or been defeated in battle. However, that's probably because Napoleon didn't like to use them very much. Just their presence on the field was a huge morale boost to the rest of the army. Normally he didn't want to test the myth of their invulnerability, but on this occasion he had no choice. The old guard marched towards the Allied centre, and with La Haison safely in French hands, there appeared to be very little standing in their way. But Wellington had one last trick up his sleeve. Now, oh, Maitland! Now's your time! Those first volleys were devastating at point-blank range. Wiping out 20% of the old guard in one go and this amount of firepower would prove to be too much. First, the old guard began to retreat, but when the rest of the French army saw the myth of their invulnerability shatter, the retreat caused the entire army to panic and rout. Damn me, expert. If I ever saw 30,000 men run a race before. The whole line will advance. In which direction, Your Grace? Why straight ahead, to be sure. Any semblance of order in the French army evaporated as both the Allies and the Prussians bared down on them. 
Napoleon had to accept the truth that he had been beaten and he fled on a carriage back to Paris. After nine hours and close to 70,000 dead on both sides, the Battle of Waterloo was finally over. Normally when I make these videos, historical accuracy is always at the forefront of my mind. In fact, it pretty much dominates my reviews. However, during my research of Waterloo, it has been pretty difficult. In fact, you could say that I've been wonderfully frustrated just how accurate this movie is. On one hand, I love this movie for that, but it gives me very little to work with as a writer. For the most part, what you see on the screen is pretty much exactly how it all went down. Now, of course there are some inaccuracies here and there, but nothing that compares to what we usually get in other historical movies. I'll point a few of them out as examples, but to be honest, they really don't bother me. Like, for example, Waterloo shows us the famous Duchess of Richmond's Ball that really did take place on June 15th in Brussels. So what's the inaccuracy here? It didn't take place in a lavish ballroom like we see in the movie, but something more like a converted coach house or a barn. So, yeah, I, I, I couldn't care less about that. I mean, as far as inaccuracies goes, that's pretty tame. Another one is when we see British soldiers sing a song about Napoleon. The reason why this song is inaccurate is because it's a song that details the entire life story of Napoleon, from his early school days to Waterloo and his exile to St Helena. It was actually written in the 1820s and couldn't have been sung in Waterloo. Born he was sent away, away, away in St Helena, Jean-Francois. Yet again, inaccuracies such as these don't really bother me. Unlike some other ones. It's round. The only other big inaccuracy in the movie that I can think of, that I didn't miss anyway, is the awesome badass scene where the British ask the old guard to surrender. Brave Frenchman, you have done all that the honour of war requires. His Grace the Duke of Wellington invites you to save your lives. Will you agree to surrender? So the guy who shouted merde is the historical figure Pierre Cambrone. He allegedly shouted merde, which means shit in French, or he said, please excuse my poor French, le garde me et ne se rompt pas, which means the guard dies and does not surrender. This was reported by a journalist called Rougemont. However, Pierre did not die at Waterloo like he's shown in the movie. He was taken prisoner and stated until his dying day that he never said either statement. But. What's really funny is that when Pierre died, the French just ignored him and slapped it on his statue anyway. It was like they were saying, no, 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 bullshit, you said it, look, see, we put it on your statue, it's set in stone now. So, once again, this doesn't bother me because it's a really cool scene. I love the fact that even the inaccuracies are somewhat based on history. It just shows you how much the filmmakers cared about this time period and, for the most part, accurately bring it to life. I don't think we will ever see this much care and attention put into a historical film again. From a production standpoint, it's insane. To recreate the battlefield, they bulldozed two hills, planted 5,000 trees, rebuilt Hougmont and Le Haisson, and laid down five miles of road. And by using the 16,000 soldiers from the Soviet army, they spent months teaching them Napoleonic drill formations, how to march accurately, which a lot of films don't bother with, by the way, and teaching them how to load and fire muskets and cannons. If this was made today, all of this would be CGI and would look like crap. Nothing can compare to the real thing. Little tiny details like the sunlight glinting off an army's weapons wouldn't even occur to computer animators. And what's ultimately sad in the end is that they will never make a film like Waterloo again. 
in the past 46 years, I have seen no other film that has come close to what this one has achieved. That's why Waterloo has such a special place in my heart. It even inspired me to come up with the concept of history buffs. The Scots Great Charge is one of my favourite paintings, and when I saw it being recreated on film, it always stayed with me. It was like seeing history come to life. Well, that about wraps it up. My name is Nick Hodges and thanks for watching History Buffs. And remember, if you like the show, help the channel grow. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button and let me know in the comments section what you thought about Waterloo and of course what historical movie should I review next. In the meantime check out the History Buffs Twitter and Facebook pages for new updates. Until then, I'll see you next time.